O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your tight hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the everlasting. Psalm 139, 1 through 12, 23 and 24.
Uh, please stand for the opening prayer. I don't. Okay. Uh, dear God, thank you for bringing us safely to church today and for helping us be safe during the week. And thank you for everything and for helping us to be together and help us to listen to your word today and to be safe. And please forgive us of all our sins and bless our friends and family. Amen. Amen. Uh, please stand for the remain standing for the hymn of praise. Yeah. <laughs>
Good morning, church. And welcome to a glimpse of what happened this past week in Vacation Bible School. Our celebration began with our crews being divided by Lori Henry, um, Linda Marquez, and Janice Wong. And uh, once they were distributed, they went to the celebration in the chapel where Patty Gomez led them with lively songs and stories. And she has energy, I have to tell you. And it was fun and energetic. So we traveled to, two, to four different stations where kids experienced Peru. Lisa Vigil and Dusty Castro travel um, to the Bible expedition with Marina Ferreiro and Alice Lou. They ate yummy, yummy treats prepared by the slew of volunteers in the fellowship hall led by Mrs. Tulgar and Mrs. Lorenz. Then some of them played games with Audrey and John and they had a lot, a lot of fun. The evening ended at the celebration area also with more songs, stories, and God sightings. These flowers that you see over here were uh, representing the sightings that every child and the crew leaders uh, talked about for that evening. We were blessed by the active participation of two of our pastors, Shane Ackerman and Pastor Brooks. We thank you, our church family, for your prayers in supporting us and uplifting us for this year. Our mission emphasis was the water, if you see our display there, for the children in Peru. And Mrs. Vigil, are you here? Okay, we were aiming for 100 children, and I think we made it with $500 just being brought day by day. So Debbie, wasn't that great? It is wonderful. Thank you so much for helping us. Bear with me. The spirit of prophecy accounts for the years young Jesus spent at the time learning of, of his heavenly father at the feet of Mary and the quiet influence of Joseph. In the chapter, As a Child of Desire of Ages, we are told of the gentle modeling of his character at his humble home on this earth. We thank you for supporting all the adult and young volunteers and partnering with us to lead the children of Alejo Drive Church to the feet of Jesus, that they may love him and follow him all the rest of their lives. We thank you so much for allowing us to share this little time with you. May God continue blessing you. And um, what you will hear and see at this time will be lively music and quiet music, Bible story by Marina, and the memory verses led by um, Patty and the children. We hope that these children keep all these verses in their hearts for the rest of their lives. Gracias to all of our volunteers in our church for supporting us and to God be the glory. Children, would you please stand up? And we're gonna give our sorrows to Jesus, right? And he will make it all right.
we'd like to thank our ladies that are in front, directly from Peru, and over there by Rico is one other friend that came to join in our celebration. God is colorful. God is good. Thank you, everybody. Now let's sing about our friend Jesus. I have a friend. I have a friend. our kitchen crew had a counting of every day the participants that ate in their realms and we had 91, 94, 95, 96 children and um, volunteers. So that was a very great success. If you see in your inserts, there are list of names of the people that have contributed. Some of you are missing but God knows, and he will take and count your participation. I know that Fred Klein's name is not here, and he helped us to set it up. Now, Miss Patty, memory verses. Stand up, children. Boys and girls, and Miss Marina, your time. Hi, kids. Hello. I'm not sure if you guys had more fun with me this week or if I had more fun. It's right there. So, um, I wanted to ask you, who remembers who wore this? Okay, let me see Charlize over here. Who wore this in our story? King David. King David, yes. And King David, before he was a king, he had a different job. What was it? Uh, Elijah. 
Shepherd. A shepherd, yes. And he wrote a beautiful, beautiful psalm, and it's in the Bible today. And we learn that God gives us what? God gives us comfort. Yes. <laughs> So that was our first day. We learned that God gives us comfort, right? And then on, on the second day, remember the old, old man at the church and Anna? They were waiting their whole life for a special surprise. You remember? And God had to give them what? Let's see, heaven. Patience. Patience. So on the second day, we learned that God gives us Patient. And what do we say? <laughs> awesome. And then on the third day, we learned, we saw Jesus and the disciples on a boat, and they were getting water out of the boat and throwing shit, fish out of the boat. And what did we learn that day? That God can give us what? Let me see. I'm going to go over there. Grace. God gives us what? Love. Yes, God gives us love. Rosie. Comfort. Comfort. Yes, and the day that the disciples were freaking out, what did they need? Kayla? They, they woke up God. They woke up God, exactly. Kayla, what did they need? Peace. Peace, because they were super scared, right? Sometimes we need peace. So God also gives us peace. And what do we say? <laughs> and then on day number four, we learned the most important lesson of all. And we use these hearts to write what? Who remembers what we wrote in this? Alyssa. Um, letters. Letters, yeah. What were those letters? Do you remember? Yes. What did you say? Your name? Yes. yes. We wrote our names. And then who remembers what we wrote on the other side? I'm going to go over here to Katie. What did we write on the other side? Our sins. Our sins. And where did we put those sins? Let me see somebody. Uxwa, where did we put these? We punted them where? Where did we put these? Do you remember? The trans <laughs> Okay, Charlize, do you remember where we put these? On the cross. Yes, we put all our sins on the cross and then they disappeared. That's what Jesus did. He paid for our sins. And then on the very, very last day, we had to go into a scary, dark, what? A scary, dark. Let me see. Somebody didn't talk. Isaiah, can you tell me what, where we went the last day? A dark, dark, dungeony place. We went to prison. We went to prison on the last day. Yes, and we had to wear handcuffs. And there were some nasty, creepy crawlies in there, too. And that day we learned that God can give us what? Let me see. God can give us joy. Joy. Even in a nasty, scary place, God can give us joy. So it was five gifts that we learned that God can give us. Comfort, patience, peace, love, and joy. And we say what? <laughs> you guys were so much fun this week. I hope you remember those five gifts and carry them in your heart, okay? Have a great day. Before you leave, each of you gets to take one of these beautiful flowers home. Those flowers can be a reminder of the beautiful gift that God has given us, okay? And wait, teacher Alma says, don't leave just yet, but you get to take a flower home. Let me give the mic to her. When peace like a river attended my way, when so
Good morning, church. I would like the deacons to come forward at this time. Today's offering is for conference emergency relief. If you would like your offering to go to this, please write so on your envelopes. All loose offerings will go to church budget. I have been a part of VBS for many years. I started as a participant, and now I'm a crew leader, and I love this amazing experience. We have many expenses to make this possible, and the VBS department needs your financial support to cover some of these expenses. Please help us by writing VBS on your envelope. Thank you.
bless this offering and each giver and those who are not able to give. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today, Jennifer and I will be reading the parable of weeds among the wheat. It is found in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared well. 
And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Thank you. Um, please bow your heads. Um, Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity of us coming together as a church family. Um, thank you for the experience and of t us teaching the little ones about God and of Peru and all the wonders that you have. Thank you for giving us the knowledge and the know-how to teach them and putting your words in our mouth. Please bless on Pastor Luke as he gives the sermon and um, let, his, let his words be your words. Amen. <laughs> church. How's everyone doing today? Good, I hope. I'm going to ask you, as usual, if you wouldn't mind having the passage of the day maybe on you, on your person somehow, either on your phone or on your Bible. Uh, so if you want to flick your Bibles to Matthew uh, 13, 24 to 30, just so you can um, have the passage there to, to refer to as we work through it this morning. Now, in this passage today, we have Jesus again telling us, telling, telling the disciples, telling the crowds another parable. And so try to sort of imagine this in your mind's eye. A, Jesus would have adopted this typical teaching style of a rabbi. So imagine Jesus now not standing, but as a teacher, as a rabbi, actually sitting and the crowds gather around him. Uh, waiting expectantly to hear his wisdom. But before we get into today's parable, I think it's always good just to remind ourselves uh, what, what is a parable exactly? Um, so just bear this in mind. A parable is basically a short fictional story that tends to be written in a very uh, poetic, evocative kind of way. So a parable is more than just a description of an event. Parables are by nature, they're kind of mysterious. They contain deep truths that lie beneath the surface. Unlike other short stories, parables are designed to, to kind of draw the listener into another world and elicit a very kind of visceral response. A parable is kind of a bit like your favorite book or your favorite movie, something that really captivates you. When you listen to a parable, you're supposed to identify with certain characters. At the end of a parable, the listener is meant to feel unnerved, a little bit judged, a little bit convicted that you need to change something in your life. So parables are enigmatic. You always walk away from listening to Jesus' parables 
scratching your head, confused, mulling over the story in your mind. You know, in fact, in today's parable, it opens by saying, Jesus sets before them another parable. This word for set before, in the Greek, it's paratithemai. And it was a word that was used to describe food being laid out, being set before a guest. So in other words, Jesus is saying, I want my parables to be chewed. I want them to be consumed. I want them to be digested like a good meal. I mean, I'm sure you guys know this from your Bible studies, but, you know, Jesus was obviously an expert in using language and metaphors that were relevant to his audience. And so, given the fact that he's, uh, you know, Jesus was around in a predominantly agrarian society, Jesus uses all this agricultural imagery, doesn't he? He talks about farmers and fields and grain and seeds and weeds and barns. You get the idea? You know, if Jesus had come in our time, 2017, Jesus would be t uh, telling parables about CEOs, about corporations, about technology, about social media. But the thing about today's parable, which I'm sure you'll agree with me, is particularly striking is this unavoidable theme of judgment. I was kind of a little bit reluctant to talk about this passage on a, on a, on a, during a service that was all about VBS and children, this very striking uh, parable of judgment, but I think we can work through it anyway. So let's quickly just interpret. It's, I think it's, it's fairly clear, this parable. Let's interpret it clearly. Jesus, okay, is the farmer who sows the seed, the seed being God's good kingdom in the world. And as we saw last week, remember, you know, with the, the parable of the sower, God doesn't, dis God never discriminates where he plants. In God's love, he generously disperses his good seed over all types of ground, even though he knows full well many people will reject it. The slaves are the disciples, and they notice that an enemy of the field, which is Satan, has planted poisonous weeds among the good seed. And so the disciples ask Jesus, shall we destroy the weeds? But Jesus says, no, don't destroy them. Let them coexist with you. Instead, Jesus promises this future harvest time, whereby the harvesters, who later we find out are the angels, will come and separate the good seeds from the bad weeds. And Jesus says, again, very harshly it may seem, the weeds get thrown into the fire for burning, and the fruit-bearing seed will get gathered into my barn. So the word that, again, I think you guys will know this, but the word that Jesus usually uses for when he's talking about hell, the word he usually uses is Gehenna, which was, of course, referring to those rubbish dumps that were around the city of Jerusalem. But here, Jesus calls it a furnace, this place where unwanted vegetation gets incinerated. For those who consistently reject Christ's kingdom, this is their ultimate fate. I get it. I'm with you. This passage is a little bit frightening. Is it a little bit extreme? Yeah. Is it a little bit judgmental? Yes, it is. But it's here in the Bible, and you know we don't want to avoid those passages that we don't automatically get drawn to, so we have to deal with it. I think that nowadays... People tend to be a little bit allergic to any talk of judgment. We tend to be kind of relativistic, don't we, when we talk about morality. You'll hear people say today, oh, there's no real black and white, no real right and wrong. You could just do whatever feels good for you in your life. It's wrong to judge people. But here's the thing. 
No one really believes that judgment is bad. We have to make judgments all the time. All the decisions we make about our lives require judgment. Who to marry, what to spend your money on, what it means to be a good person. And when friends and family ask for your advice in life, they ask for your judgment and you give it to them. I think judgment is good and deep down we all, we all know that. And maybe if your life is really secure and you're provided for, you don't think about the need for an intervening judge very much. But the greatest desire for the abused and for the needy in the world is that they need a judge with real authority who will come to their aid, notice their injustice, and vindicate them. And so we raise our children doing everything we can to instill in them a real sense of what is absolutely right to do and what is absolutely wrong to do. Don't touch the fire. Don't play with sharp objects. Don't become addicted to superficial things when you grow up. Forgive people who hurt you. Share your resources and your money and your talents with other people. We do everything we can to help our children develop a connection with God and their fellow humans and, and to cultivate good virtues as they grow up, the virtues of love and hope and faith and justice. But the problem in today's parable is that the slaves, the disciples, they want to play the role of the divine judge. But they are reminded, and so we are reminded, you never get to decide the ultimate, eternal fate of individuals. That final judgment is reserved for Christ alone. So maybe you're tempted in your life to uproot all the bad weeds, but Jesus says, no, no, no. Good seeds and bad weeds get to grow together. Believers and unbelievers coexist side by side until my ultimate final judgment. And isn't that another truth that we want to share with our kids today? That when they encounter other people who believe different things than they do, not to feel superior and better than them. When they encounter others who didn't grow up with the same support networks and the same opportunities to share generously what they have. When they experience hostility and resentment from their most unchristian friends, not to cast them to hell in their minds, but to work hard to convert them with love and forgiveness. Judgment must come from beyond, but in the meantime, we can embody the practices of truth-telling and reconciliation that anticipate God's future kingdom. Now, I know that it's typical for us Adventists, right, to get very caught up in talking about end times. But you'll notice in our parable today, God doesn't seem to be in a hurry to end the world. Disciples are called rather to live patiently before the end. So I don't know, maybe the extra time that we've been given is an opportunity to convert the weeds. And maybe Jesus would come sooner if we actually got serious about our call to evangelism. So let me stay for a moment with this theme of good and evil being allowed to coexist. And here's, here's the thought that I think this parable brings out. Suffering in the world is always an opportunity for immense good. Suffering is always an, op an opportunity for good. 
Think of a child's first day at school. Maybe you remember, some of you, what that was like. Being ripped away from the comfort of mum and dad. Being ripped away from your house. Being ripped away from everything familiar. What a traumatic experience. But a good chance, a good opportunity to develop new dependence. A good opportunity to form new relationships. A good opportunity to get an education. It's suffering, but it's a chance for good. Or at the other end of the spectrum, think of the extreme poverty, disease, and death that plagues a country like India, for example. Yet that evil became the opportunity for St. Teresa of Calcutta to form a sisterhood of 4,500 people active in 133 countries, giving herself wholeheartedly to the poorest of the poor, living a life of total sacrificial love. You know, the phrase goes, without the cruelty of the tyrant, there is no virtue of the martyr. Now, does the good that can come out of the suffering, does that justify the evil and the suffering. No, of course not. Nevertheless, in the midst of evil, there is always a chance for God's people to gather together and to shine more brightly. Living in a world where good and evil coincide, if our faith is deeply rooted enough, if we spend time cultivating it in prayer, in worship, in this community, in self-sacrifice, we will bear good fruit. And I don't think that there's any message more timely for our children today. So I want to close with another short parable, actually the parable that immediately comes after the one we read today. It says, Jesus proposed another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a person took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when full grown, it is the largest of plants. It becomes a large bush and the birds of the sky come and dwell in its branches see where I'm going with this. Our hope and our prayer is that all of our children would be like that mustard seed. Though they may seem small and insignificant now, they would grow to be the largest of all the plants. And isn't that, isn't that really the message for all of us? So, friends, may you stay close to Jesus Christ. May you be good and do good in the world. May you live generous and compassionate lives, and may the love that you radiate draw people to you and to your God. Amen. Let's respond to these words of Jesus together now by, by standing and with joy and enthusiasm and passion, singing our last hymn together, It Is Well. Please stand and sing with me, it is well. Hymn number 530. It is well.
So let us leave this place with the faith of little children. May we be like mustard seeds, small, humble, and innocent, but empowered with the Holy Spirit to do great things, to reflect the love of Christ to the world, and to bear the good fruits of the kingdom of God. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.